Hi, everyone. Let's get to the end of Unit 1 for Chem 29. So take a look at key concepts. Unit 1, Part 4. It's a long series here, huh? But this is the final video. You're going to tie up some loose ends here. OK, so this is the first page of Unit 1, Part 1. Unit 1, Part 4, sorry. Uh, scroll down to your you see uh, synthesis of alcohols. Last time we talked about the Grignard reactions. Take a look at that video. We're definitely going to see them throughout the rest of the semester, not just for this unit one. You can see Grignards throughout. Um, but there are other ways of making alcohols in a somewhat simpler manner than Grignard reactions are through the, through the reduction reactions of aldehydes, ketones, and esters. And now we can also throw in the carboxylic acids. There's two reagents that are capable of reducing these carbonyl compounds, right? Aldehydes, ketones, esters, carboxylic acids possess a C double bond O, carbonyl group, and those can be changed to a CHOH, an alcohol group. Cool. Two reagents that are capable of doing that. First one is a mild reducing agent, sodium borohydride. NABH4, mild. Um, it only works on aldehydes and ketones. Or you can use a stronger reducing agent, lithium aluminum hydride. Um, it works on all four. Oh, I should have brought in the periodic table. Forgot to cut and paste that. But if you look at the periodic table, we have sodium and lithium as alkali metals on the far left of the periodic table. Towards the middle, we got boron and aluminum, and you crisscross. So if you're trying to memorize these reagents, boron and aluminum are in the same family, same column. Lithium and sodium in the same family. Just the way they tie together in the most common forms that you buy commercially is the sodium's paired with the boron, lithium paired with aluminum. A little trick some students showed me about how they remember NaBH4, Right, so you get half a point if you get all, you know, if you lose half a point, if you don't get the, the four, you make it a three, or you switch the B with an AL, now nah, that good stuff, I guess. Um, that's how they remember it. Crisscross on the periodic table. All right, let's see some examples. Let's say you have benzaldehyde. Well, it's an aldehyde, so either reagent works. So I'll just use the mild one, sodium borohydride. And you change it to an alcohol. Now, the thing to remember is that for all these reduction reactions, you definitely need a second step. You have to add acid. H3O plus is the usual form. That was a common characteristic of Grignard reactions, right? Every time we did a Grignard reaction with an aldehyde ketone or an ester, the second step is always neutralize the reaction with acid. H3O plus. Same pattern here. So it's kind of nice. The other commonality between Grignard reagents and these reduction reactions are the mechanisms. They're very, very similar. So that's good. So if you haven't taken a look at the Grignard reactions yet and their mechanism, please do that first. It'll make it easier to understand these reactions here. All right. We got an aldehyde here. First reaction is sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. Both reagents works, uh, work on aldehydes. And then dilute it with acid afterwards. And then all you do is copy the molecule. So if I make a double bond, then I have my benzaldehyde molecule. But don't put the double bond in there. It's now an alcohol. That's it. If you're predicting products, we're all good. And then let's highlight what we can do if we have a ketone and carboxylic acid, whatever. If you use the mild reducing agent, it only works on aldehydes and ketones. So now we have some, we got some control. Do you want to reduce? both functional groups, get rid of both dobanos and make them alcohols? No, you don't have to. Use the mild reducing agent and only the ketone or an aldehyde. If you have both a molecule, they both react. So copy the molecule. 
And then here's where the carboxylic acid goes. Well, it's going to be left unchanged because the mild reducing agent, sodium borohydride, doesn't react with carboxylic acids. It only reacts with aldehydes and ketones. So the ketone group gets changed to an alcohol. However, can you squeeze in here? I'll squeeze in up here. Let's take that same molecule, ketone, benzene ring, and then a carboxylic acid. Someone else might say, no, get rid of all the double bonos. Reduce my ketone and my carboxylic acid to an alcohol. Okay, so use lithium ammonium hydride, an acid, and then lithium ammonium hydride. There's four H's. So each hydrogen is capable of a, of a reduction reaction. Um, if you're balancing this equation, you would need um, two of these molecules for every one lithium hydride. And down here, you need four ketones for every sodium borohydride. There's four H's here. Uh, but again, the organic chemist rarely balances equations when they talk about the course of a you know, the outcome of a reaction, it's usually in lab, whoops, it's usually in lab when you have to pay attention to um, balancing equations just to get your reagents added correctly. Here we go. So um, choices on the carboxylic acid. Some students like to delete the double bond O and just leave this OH group as their alcohol. Um, I'm more visual, so I think of the double bond up as changing to the alcohol, so I leave the double bond up change that to alcohol, and I just have to remember to remove the other one. Otherwise, you have a diol, and we'll see next semester, that's actually just the hydrated form, the wet form <laughs> of an aldehyde or ketone. Anyways, these are the products. And then now we have choices. Do you want to keep the carboxylic acid, or do you want to get rid of it? Choose between the mild and strong oxidizing agents, and you can control the outcome. Cool. Oh, Esther. We should do that one next. Um, let's do that with the mechanism. We need to know the mechanism. And the key here is first understand the Grignard reaction mechanism, because we can just apply it here. Very cool. So let's take an ester, this any ester, and I'm just going to keep non acetone nail polish remover going. Um, cannot use sodium borohydride because it's too mild to react with an ester. So if you're going to reduce an ester, or a carboxylic acid, you must use lithium aluminum hydride, otherwise you get no reaction. Okay, mechanism. If you Google this, get an organic textbook, dive deep into these reagents, it turns out I'm gonna oversimplify the mechanism. In other words, I'm wrong. Okay, but I just want the main idea. So you're gonna get full credit in the exams if you take my shortcut. Um, maybe I'll hint at the full mechanism as I discuss this. But right now, think of lithium hydride, lithium aluminum hydride as first an ionic compound. Do the same thing with sodium borohydride, right? So the alkali metals like to form cations. And so if this whole thing is neutral, which it is, lithium, lithium aluminum, sorry, the lithium ion is a cation. The remaining piece, the aluminum hydride part, must be negative, and it is. Okay, if you draw the Lewis dot structures, they're going to be tetrahedral, and so forth. And now what we have here, especially with aluminum, um, aluminum is a metal. It's considered a metal. You um, have a metal with a non-metal. You might be thinking, wait, in general chemistry, I was told that normally a bond between a metal and non-metal is ionic. Okay, the, but there's exceptions, right? Chemistry's full of them. But if you start to remember that, wait, metal with non-metals are ionic, then you start to think, at least I do, that this is a very polar covalent bond, maybe even ionic. And in fact, and this is the shortcut, it's not exactly true but you can start to think of the aluminum as sort of like a plus three cation. And each of the hydrogens 
as being a negative anion, the hydride ion or anion. Okay. And so that's my shortcut, is instead of drawing the full structure covalently bound together, which most research is showing that is the case, we'll take the shortcut and just say, hey, both these reagents, both reducing reagents, provide hydride ions. And do the mechanism with the hydride ion. Right, okay, so it's not entirely true, but it's gonna get you the product and it's gonna explain step-by-step um, -step how products are made. But again, chemistry majors, you probably should take a look at the true mechanism or email me and we'll go over it just so you have that in your belt in case it's in, you encounter it later. Here's the one I need you to know for my exams. Lone pair on the hydride ion bumps up the pi bond. Hey, that's exactly what a Grignard reagent did. Go back to the previous video and look up how in, in a Grignard reagent, we can draw a resonance structure such that carbon has a lone pair and a negative charge. And the lone pair attacks the carbonyl carbon and the pi electrons move up on the oxygen as a new lone pair. So copy the ester, take away the pi bond, where the pi electrons go onto the oxygen as a new lone pair. So let's start with two lone pairs, I gained a third. We attach the hydrogen. Now, if you're drawing skeletal drawings, you don't have to draw it in here, but you can if you want to. So I'm going to, you know, it's not required. And then like a Grignard reactant reagent attacking an ester, the next step is the lone pair comes right back down to reform the double bond. And then one of the other three bonds has to break. It's not the carbon, the carbon bond, carbon, carbon, alkanes, very, very stable. It's not the carbon-hydrogen bond, that's sort of like an alkane. CH bonds are actually very stable normally. It's the carbon-oxygen bond. Oxygen is more electronegative. Tugging on these electrons, it's more um, electronegative. The bonding electrons are moving towards the oxygen, weakening this bond. And so as a lone pair comes down to make a double bond, giving this carbon four bonds, carbon just releases these electrons and says, yep, you can have them oxygen. So double bonds restored, and then the hydrogen's there from the first reduction step. Lithium hydride, released hydride ion, bumped up the pi bond. And then this broke away as the ethoxide ion, if you want a name for it. Okay, we'll have to remember to bring that in at the end. When we add acid, we add H plus to this base and make it alcohol, um, ethanol, make it an alcohol. But now, lithium hydride has four hydrogens. There's plenty of hydride around and we made an aldehyde out of this ester. So what happens next? Another hydride ion reacts with that aldehyde. Turns out aldehydes are more reactive than esters. So no way is this gonna survive if there's hydride or ion around. The hydride will choose not to go after ester, but still go after the aldehyde because aldehydes are more reactive. Okay, and then we'll put it down here. Um, bump up the pi bond, so let's copy those atoms. If I put in a double bond, I will have the aldehyde back, but nope, the pi electrons moved up onto oxygen as a new lone pair. The second hydrogen added in, and I'm going to choose to draw it. You don't have to, because it's a skeletal drawing. And then we're done. Um, if you're wondering, well, wait, can't the pi bond reform and kick out a hydrogen? No. Um, hydrogen's a very powerful base, not very stable. That's why it's covalently bound here. Carbon-hydrogen bonds are strong. It's not likely to break. No, it just stops dead end. And then now let's go grab this molecule, the anion of the alcohol, because that didn't change with hydride ion. And now it's time, second step, add the acid. If you wanna draw it again, you can, just to simplify or clarify your mechanism. We're just gonna quench the anions. This oxygen is base, so hey, here's some acid for you. Acid bases neutralize 
and then we're done. I guess I'll be consistent. I don't have to draw on the hydrogens. I just made ethanol <laughs> right here. And then we also have ethanol over here. Cool. Okay, that was the mechanism for an, eth an ester. You wanna see the mechanism for an aldehyde? You already did, <laughs> right? So start here. So if you start with aldehyde, you won't have that molecule because anion of an alcohol. So add hydride ion, either from sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride, they both work. Hydride ion bumps up the double, double bond, you get this intermediate, add the acid in the second step, you got the alcohol. What happens if you start with a ketone? Well, change this hydrogen to a carbon. And that is a ketone. Okay, so the aldehyde and ketone mechanisms are identical. The same pattern was seen in the Grignard reaction. Yeah, so if this is a carbon, it doesn't matter. The mechanism doesn't change. Instead of drawing H here, you draw a C or a methyl, whatever it is. Cool. The only mechanism we haven't seen is the carboxylic acid. So let's see that one now. Okay, so another mechanism. Let's, um, oh, let's just draw benzoic acid. Why not? And then which reagent? Sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride? Lithium aluminum hydride. Um, the sodium borohydride is a mild one, only reacts with aldehydes and ketones. So if we want to react or reduce, the carboxylic acid need the strong reducing agent, lithium aluminum hydride. Always follow it up with the acid step, just like in our Grignard reactions. If you want the mechanism, the shortcut is lithium aluminum hydride releases hydride ions, the lone pair on the, on the hydrogen. So what you're going to take, and here's a little thing. Um, I know this carbon is slightly positive, drawing in the negative hydrogen, but carboxylic acid has an H plus sitting right here. And acid-base reactions are so much faster than anything else in organic chemistry. So hydride ion, the first one, does not bump up the pi bond. It actually goes after the hydrogen here. So you create the anion with carboxylic acid. And then you make hydrogen gas. So H minus plus H plus makes H2 gas. Add another hydride ion. And now it bumps up the pi bond. This part is a little slow because we have two negative things coming towards each other. Now I'm looking at my notes and realizing, hmm. I don't think I'm gonna put this mechanism on the exam. Because there's a later step that we haven't seen yet. I'll keep going, just so you have it. Okay, but I got the note there, it's not on the exam. Optional material, some of you are already fast forwarding. Yeah, I know your time is limited, you can do that. Fast forward to the next topic if you wish. Okay, we're gonna bump up the pi bond. Okay, and then we have the hydrogen here. Yeah, so you, yeah, and this is not what I wanted to do. So I'm glad some of you are not here, you fast forwarded already. Ha, let's go back and talk about the actual mechanism. Aldehyde or a ketone, let's, I'm sorry, let's start with either reducing agent. And we really have this, this compound. And then we can form the hydride ion equilibrium and it bumps up the pi bond. And actually, now I'm wondering if this is the true mechanism. Sometimes it, anyways, I'm gonna go with this.
the aluminum atom has three bonds. It's sp2, and there's an empty p orbital. Now, what you can get is a Lewis acid base reaction. The lone pair on the oxygen, and maybe it's equilibrium, can bond to the aluminum. And then this compound can react with another aldehyde to get the other hydrogens to react. And there's also some, some discussion in the literature while, where you start the reagent and it's already in equilibrium and sometimes the aluminum will coordinate or bond to the lone pair on the aldehyde or ketone or ester or carboxylic acid. Anyways, this is why it's not an exam because the aluminum needs to coordinate here and stabilize this dianion. Yeah, um, molecules with more than a plus one or a minus one charge are very unstable. It needs some help. So the aluminum needs to be tied in here. And is it the second one too? Is it maybe probably just the first one? And then that can help the reaction to continue to supply a second hydrogen to bump up the pi bond and actually get rid of this oxygen. Anyways, not on the exam. Sorry I put it in here. Mechanism of carboxylic acids, not on your exam. But you still need to know what happens when a carboxylic acid reacts with lithium aluminum hydride. You just reduce. Let's put that in here. No for exams. Predict the products. So let's say we have an ester and we have a carboxylic acid and we decide, hey, what are the products when you reduce these? And you must use lithium hydride, the strong oxidant, I'm oh, sorry, not strong reducing agent. And you always follow up with dilute acid, hydronium ion. Okay, so if you're just predicting products, you're gonna cut it here, right? To make the aldehyde. We still got the mechanism up here. We do, yeah. So first step, hydride bumps out the pi bond. Second step, pi bond comes back and splits off the oxygen with the ethyl group and you make an aldehyde. And then second step, another hydro hydride ion comes up, bumps up the pi bond. Okay, so if you're predicting products, mechanisms help you predict products, but sometimes you just want a shortcut. And so here's a shortcut, first hydrogen, Bumps up the pi bond, pi bond comes back down, breaks this bond. You get an aldehyde. Second hydrogen reduces the aldehyde to the alcohol. So where the dull bond currently is, that's where the OH group um, ends up. And then we cut off, we unlink the ester, and this oxygen is also an alcohol. Hydrogen ions from the dilute acid quench the anion that forms. Cool. And now it turns out that's the same pattern for carboxylic acid. Um, we didn't finish the mechanism, but in the mechanism, one oxygen, the OH group gets eliminated. I believe it forms hydroxide ion, which then turns in the water with acid later. And then when you do make an aldehyde, and the aldehyde then gets reduced by another hydride ion to form an alcohol. And you could say water, you talk about where the second oxygen goes, but on my exams, you only have to track the carbons. You can leave the water molecule off of your exams and still get full credit. Cool. Okay, two reducing agents, quite useful. We'll see those. Okay, what's next? Well, just gonna tie up some new loose ends. So here's something that could have been introduced earlier in our two semester course of organic chemistry. Sometimes it's saved for later, but it's a brand new topic, but it's connected. So we're gonna bring it in now. It's called protect protecting group chemistry. So 
This came about because there's so many reactions in chemistry that are limited. There's restrictions. We just saw the Grignard reagent last time say, hey, Grignard reactions, or rather Grignard reagents can't be made that have both magnesium in the molecule and a carbonyl, C double bond L group. Why? Because Grignard reagents attack them. So they're incompatible. Also, you cannot make a Grignard reagent that also contains an acidic hydrogen because Grignard's are strong bases. Any acid in the molecule will then react and quench itself. And that's a serious limitation. Those are two serious limitations. Fair craft reactions also have limitations. Okay, well, what if there's just this really cool molecule you want to make that would just work so well through a Grignard reaction? Are you just, and, but, as you plan it out, you realize, wait, the Grignard reagent I need is incompatible. Ah. Well, some very clever scientists said, there's a workaround, there's a loophole, and it's called projecting group chemistry. And about the time this was being discovered and exploited, there was a PhD student, Theodora Green, who was doing some work and her thesis advisor said, you know what? I think there might be some value in this type of of chemistry, why don't you research and kind of develop some ways, some workarounds, some loopholes and in this new field called protecting group chemistry. And she was so successful, she had her thesis published. People were like, yeah, we want that information, good work. Um, no one's asked for copies of my thesis. <laughs> so it's literally, I am kind of jealous. Um, she then rewrote her thesis and started publishing books. <laughs> And so there's several editions of her protective group chemistry book, Protecting Groups or Protective Groups. That's working on this, this theme. And she got a co-author here, so she doesn't have to do all the work anymore. Still click on the revenue. Nice job. Okay, what is this protecting group chemistry all about? Well, here's the overall strategy. You start with a reaction that's having trouble. We've seen several cases now between Grignard reactions and Friel Craft reactions, but there are all the, also other types of reactions. And what you have to do is identify the functional group that's causing a problem. So suppose you're trying to do a Grignard reagent, trying to do a Grignard reaction, and your reagent currently has an acid group on it. That's the functional group that's causing a problem. Maybe there's a carboxylic acid on the molecule. Well, what you do is you add an extra step that protects that group, protects it from the limitation or changes it into something else. You kind of get rid of it, but only temporarily. And once that non or incompatible functional group is missing, now the Grignard reaction and the Friel Craft reaction should work just fine. So go ahead and do that. That's step three, go run your reaction. But step four is wait, that functional group that was causing a problem you probably want to keep that or you want it showing up in the final product. So now do a second extra reaction that gets it back. Okay, so, so normally you just do the reaction you want and hope for the best. But if there's a limitation, step one, find out what the limitation is. Step two, mask it, put a mask on it, like a Halloween mask or protect it. Do your reaction, so it's hiding behind the mask, behind the protecting group shielding it from the reagent. And then afterwards, remove the mask, remove the shield, get that functional group back. Okay, let's see an example. Um, there's lots of ways to protect different groups. Um, usually one type of functional group needs one type of protection and you switch to a different functional group, you need another type of protection. Hence, that's why there's a book. <laughs> so I just wanna um, illustrate the concept and I will require that you memorize this protecting group, but it's not universal. There are many, many other protecting groups. Well, we'll see some of them throughout the rest of this organic chemistry course. And I'll let you know which ones you need to know for exams. This one, yes, you need, need to know. Okay, before we introduce the protecting group, let's set up the problem. Let's um, exploit one of the mechanisms, sorry, one of the limitations of a free or craft reaction. Let's say we want to make, we wanna make this molecule. Whoops, I'm already thinking 
ultrasynthetic analysis. We want to make this molecule. We want to make a secondary alcohol um, that has a phenol group, an you know, alcohol group on benzene. Okay, that's cool. Well, you know, it's maybe it's multi-step synthesis and you have to think backwards and you say, hmm, okay, how am I supposed to make this molecule? Well, one strategy is to recognize, recognize that's a secondary alcohol. Hey, a Grignard reagent plus an aldehyde will form secondary alcohols. So go take a look at our previous video on Grignard reagents to look at these strategies. Okay, cool. Well, then what we want to do is um, where there's currently the alcohol group, that carbon, put a little dot there, that used to be double bonded as my aldehyde. So maybe what I'll do is I'll say, hey, okay, the original aldehyde maybe had this methyl group here. So there's my structure of the aldehyde portion of my Grignard reaction. And the remaining unit, this one here. Okay, so let's put another dot. This is where I got the connection. So this carbon is here. That's where my Grignard reagent was. And use your favorite halide with magnesium. And every Grignard reaction is hydronium. Cool. And then thinking backwards, you might say, okay, this used to have a bromine on here and an OH, and this had magnesium, and then you still have to make this molecule. And you keep going backwards, retrosynthetic analysis, try and figure out how to get here. Oh, and um, you probably have to make the aldehyde, but you can make it from an alcohol. Remember how to do that? What insane reaction changes alcohols and aldehydes? The pariodinane reaction, insane pariodinane. So take another look at that <laughs> previous video too. Okay, so we haven't finished. There's more steps here. But here you can see that, hey, if we had to make this molecule, that's a good strategy, except this molecule does not exist. You can't make it. Why not? Um, there's a Grignard reagent here, a powerful base, and this hydrogen is acidic towards a very powerful Grignard. There's a hydrogen on the oxygen, and this carbon attached to magnesium will steal this hydrogen, and it won't wait around for an aldehyde to show up. <laughs> so while it's sitting here, it's like, hmm, let's go grab that hydrogen because carbon does not like being negative, right? Magnesium is less electronegative forcing carbon to be more electronegative, putting a charge on carbon, that's not stable. Okay, so this doesn't work. Wrong, darn it, you can't do this. You can't make this molecule from this molecule. Unless you pick up a copy of protective group chemistry from Theodore Green, you can go look up, hmm, how do you protect phenols from reacting with Grignards? You know, that OH groups is causing a problem. And one of the strategy is change it to a silyl ether. Silyl is just a nickname for the uh, silicon atom, groups with silicon. Where silicon on the periodic table, it's right below carbon. Phosphorus, sulfur, <laughs> chlorine, brain, work. Yeah, it's in the same family as carbon. It likes making four bonds, very similar. Um, so an ether, you know what an ether is, right? Carbon linked to an oxygen, to, to another carbon. Silo ether is where you're just going to change one of those carbons to silicon. Silo ether. All right. So here's your workaround. Um, let's go back up here to the strategy and we'll lay that out. How do you use a protecting group? First, identify the functional group. Here it is. This is... OH group on the benzene ring that's causing a problem. We can't make this Grignard. Okay, perform an extra reaction that protects it. Well, it's really this hydrogen that's a problem. So what we're gonna do is take, right? So we got this oxygen connected to carbon, oxygen connected to carbon, remove the hydrogen and put on silicon instead.
So we're going to start with this molecule before the Grignard's made, before we make the molecule, try to make a molecule that can't exist. Let's get rid of that acidic hydrogen. Here's our extra step. You need to add these reagents, three methyls on a silicon and a chlorine. So you can draw it if you want, three methyls and a chlorine. Sometimes you'll see Me, Me, I know, that's short for methyl. That's a little silly, but it's very common to do that. You also have to pair it up with triethylamine. So an amine with three ethyl groups hanging off of it. I'll draw a skeletal drawing. Here's the full condensed formula if you want it. And that'll put the silyl silicon atom in place of the hydrogen. So afterwards, redraw your starting material. So there's a bromine here. There's an oxygen here. I'm about ready to write the H because I'm copying the molecule, the starting material. And don't, the product has silicon here and silicon keeps its carbons. Chlorine leaves, H leaves, they pair up, HCl is made, that's a strong acid. And we see down here, how do you get rid of the silicon atom? How do you deprotect it? You add acid, ew. So if you forget the triethylamine in the laboratory, you get no product because as it's being made, as you make this molecule, the byproduct is HCl, which then will attack it and clip it off. So you add this weak base, so it doesn't do any type of weird chemistry anywhere else. It's weak base, but it's enough to react with the strong acid HCl and prevent it from doing anything bad to your product. So here's the silyl ether, we're done. And then later, you can add H plus, or this is kind of cool. Go back to Green's book and it's like, well, my final product, I have a base at the end and I don't want to react with any acids. It's like, well, that's okay. Instead of using this base, just use fluoride ion. Fluorine and silicon like to make a very strong bond and fluorine can add to the silicon and kick out the oxygen. Sort of like an SN2 reaction. You don't, you don't need to know the mechanism. Just know that you can either use sodium fluoride from toothpaste um, or you can use dilute acid. Cool, and then you just clip off the silica and you get the alcohol back or the phenol group back. All right, what else do we need to know about this protecting group? Um, triethylamine, I mentioned that, no mechanism, nope. Trimethylsilochloride, if you need a name. No, you don't need to know that. Okay, so, ooh, nice. All right, so let's actually fix our problem. The goal is trying to make this. Grignard's a good way to do it. It's just that this acidic hydrogen is causing problems. Okay, so what you do is you say, well, Back here, we're trying to make the Grignard reagent. I want to add Mg now. I want to, but if I add Mg, magnesium, it's going to make this Grignard reagent, and that doesn't exist. DNA does not exist. Isn't that from math? Um, do I have my zero? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, whatever, it's bad. <laughs> okay, so this doesn't work. So we have identified the functional group, step one, that's causing the loophole, the, the, I'm sorry, the limitation. Now you need to protect it, kind of get rid of it, kind of mask it. So we're going to add that methyl, trimethyl silyl chloride, chloride, and add your triethylamine. And then now, where the oxygen used to have a hydrogen, not anymore, now it has the silicon with three methyls. Now you can add magnesium. Let's run the Grignard reaction now. And there's nothing acidic here. There's no double bond O's. Grignard's happy, it's like, whatever. I'll find the magnesium and insert between, I'm sorry, that's bromine. I'll find the bromium, bromine, and insert between the carbon and the bromine. Now 
Now let's add the aldehyde group, which we made with, you could all use the old reagent PCC, but that's toxic and harmful. So the more environmentally friendly reagent is pyridinane. You can look up the Des Martin pyridinane molecule and you make it from the molecule with the same number of carbons, but an alcohol group. Okay. And then that's step one of a grignard reaction with magnesium. Step two, so you have to add dilute acid. And then afterwards, you have this, the grignard reacted, made the secondary alcohol, and then you add acid to cut the silyl ether and you get back the alcohol. And yay, we made the molecule. Very cool. Okay, so in summary, found our limitation. Here's our first extra step. It's a protection step or the masking step. Do the grinder that we want, and then we have to deprotect or unmask the deprotection step. That's also an extra step. Shortcuts, we all love shortcuts. And what's going on here? So imagine yourself in the lab, you do the Grignard reaction in a nice round bottom flask, it's changing color and boiling stuff, it calms down, reaction's over, you add your acid, you kind of look at, say, well, good, my acid, acid-based reactions are really fast. You got this, well, just let it sit a little longer, still got excess acid, and then it'll deprotect too. You might want to warm it up, make sure it happens. So you can actually combine these last two steps. So the exact same reagent, they're doing two different things though, right? The first equivalent, first amount of acid is going to quench the products of the Grignard reaction. A second equivalent acid will then cleave the silyl ether or cut it. Yeah. So on exams, you can just write the H3O plus once, go write the product, and I'll say, nice shortcut. That's cool. Oh, but if this is multi-step synthesis, you would still have to make this molecule. Okay. That's a topic of a different video. Last topic for this video. It's kind of a filler question. It's the oxidation of phenols. So you know what a phenol is. It's a benzene ring with an alcohol group. It's not exactly an alcohol, very similar, has similar properties, but technically it's a new functional group, I suppose. Um, one of the things you can do is you can oxidize it and you use a strong oxidizer. I'll limit myself to the dichromate ion. So on exams, if I wanna put this on there, I'll use sodium dichromate as my oxidizing agent. And then what happens is, well, where do we see that strong oxidizing agent before? Oh yeah, we saw it with alcohols. So I'll just take the little top of the benzene ring with the alcohol. And if you add sodium dichromate, what do you get? Take away the H and you double up the bond. You make a ketone. That's cool. So do the same thing here. You double up the H. Oh, sorry, take away the H and double up the bond to make a ketone. But wait, don't we have benzene in here? You do. So the oxidizing agent with all these O's adds another double bond O para to the first alcohol group. And you get this molecule, which is called a quinone. I think that one specifically is quinone. That's the parent molecule. No, it's not, it's benzoquinone, sorry. The proper name of this is benzoquinone. Is, is benzoquinone aromatic? Hmm. Okay, well, cyclic, planar, extended conjugation, Huckel number. Those are the things we have to look at. 
Cyclic, yeah, I see a ring, check. Planar, well, every atom is sp2. Everyone's got a pi bond, sp2, it's flat. Yeah, it can be flat. Um, I'll call, um, sorry, extended conjugation. Well, we just said everyone's sp2, they all have m, um, p orbitals, and that's a requirement. Every ring atom needs a p orbital, so it can have extended conjugation. Huckel number. Well, you definitely count these two pi electrons that are in the ring and these two, so I got four. But then the other pi electrons look like they're outside the ring. You know what? If you are gonna count this one, you also have to count this one. If you don't count that one, then you can't count that one. I mean, what's the difference? They're both double bond O's. So this is not aromatic. But nature allows it to exist. Okay, so it's not as stable as this, definitely not, but it exists, weird. Turns out nature does love aromatic molecules. So we can take benzoquinone and we can make it aromatic again. That's called the reduction reaction. So start with a quinone. Um, this one still is benzoquinone, but right, we could have like an ethyl branch off here or a chlorine atom here. We can start decorating it. And then we still have the quinone functional group, ring of six, double bonds either side, double bond oxygens, top bottom. That's a quinone functional group. And then you add tin chloride, which is a reducing agent. It's just going to add electrons here. And it's usually done in water. So you have a source of hydrogen and you get the benzene ring back. Oh wait, then you can't have a double bond O up here because that'll be five bonds of carbon. No, you actually make alcohol groups again. You get paraphenols. This one's called hydroquinone. And it turns out hydroquinone is aromatic. Yay, so nature's happy. That's very stable. So the ring is quite stable. But these double bond O's, we didn't really talk about. If you go and look at, what was it called? The entropy of bond formation. If you look at the energy of making bonds, remember carbon dioxide? <sighs> How could you forget? You exhale it all the time. Um, that is a very stable molecule also. And it has to do with the fact that you have C double bond O's. You got two of them, two of them. These are very stable molecules too, stable bonds too. So this part of the molecule and this part of the molecule is also very stable. You got two carbonyl groups. It's like nature can't make up her mind. It's like, well, wait, you know what? I like got my benzene ring back. Yeah, that's cool. But these alcohols, can I get them back to double bono? Sure you can. You want them back so you can get those double bonos? You can oxidize a quinone. <laughs> so start with your, um, well, it's hydroquinone. Start with the aromatic form where you have alcohol groups and now you can oxidize it. Well, just to simplify things, let's use the same oxidizing agent we did before the dichromate ion. And you go right back to the benzoquinone and have your double bond. So nature says, yay. Yay, got my double bond O's back. Oh wait, you took away my benzene ring. Well, you want back, add tin chloride. And now you can be happy nature, you got your aromatic ring back. And then it's like, well, wait, where'd my double bond O's go again? It's not quite fully happy. The point I'm trying to make here is it's really easy to go back and forth and you got two stable molecules. That's kind of unusual, right? So if you usually do a reaction, the product is like much more stable, more stable than the starting material. And that's a driving force. Here's a case where you can go back and forth quite easily. You're making stable molecules. And it's really about adding electrons through the reduction reaction so gain electrons is reduction, oil rig, and oxidation is a loss of electrons, oil rig. 
And so what in fact happens here is the quinones are electron carriers, electron tra transport vehicles, <laughs> molecules. It's easy to switch back and forth. And nature does this a lot. So there's a lot of biological systems that employ quinone functional groups. It's really important. So that's why it's here in organic chemistry. So you'll see this in biochemistry and other biologically based chemistry courses. So we introduced the concept here in organic chemistry and then we kind of dropped the ball and say, okay, if you need these set of reactions, you got them, but we're not gonna go into it any deeper than that. Oh, just kind of ended on an interesting note. Um, the bomb bombardier <laughs> fire beetle uses um, other type of quinone moieties, um, functional groups, and it's involved in vitamin K and blood clotting. Oh, there's um, plastoquinone in photosynthesis, electron transport there. Very good. Ubiquinone. It's ubiquitous in aerobic respiration. Okay, lots of stuff. It's even in face cream. We got hydroquinone here. Hydroquinone, what's that all about? Well, hydroquinone is the form that gets oxidized. So it has electrons and then the oxidizing agent steals it. It's a reducing agent. It's actually an anti-aging uh, form. It's a antioxidant. So if you heard about trying to get more antioxidants in your diet, prevent cancer, prevent um, aging and stuff. There's some studies say that free radicals cause that. So take more antioxidants. Hydroquinone is one of them. So they're making this facial cream, cream with 2% hydroquinone as a reducing agent, kind of mop up these free radicals as an as a, um, antioxidant. Cool. All righty. It's play for now. See you in the next video.